Four ways to build tension in your D&D game, plus a fungus-licking cannibal cult, today on Dungeon Craft. Welcome to Dungeon Craft, I'm Professor Dungeon Master, and this channel is about running the ultimate game of D&D. Level up your game by subscribing and click that bell icon so you'll be reminded when we upload videos every Thursday. So today I'm going to give you four tips on building tension in your game, plus it's my monthly campaign update. And I'll demonstrate these techniques with a system agnostic encounter that you can steal and plug into your own game. Before that, I'm going to ask you if you do enjoy this content, please share this video. It's the best way to grow the channel. Thank you so much. Tip number one is to let the audience know what's at stake. This tip goes all the way back to Aristotle, who believed that every story should present a crisis. There should be great consequences if the characters fail, and the audience should know what those consequences are right at the start of the drama. Let's apply this to my own campaign, The Caverns of Carnage. It's a grim, dark update of the classic Gygax module Keep on the Borderlands, a sandbox adventure that features a home base, the Keep, and a nearby dungeon, the Caves of Chaos. The caves are populated with different tribes of monsters, and several caves, B, H, and I, feature prison cells. But there's no mechanism for letting the players know that these prisoners are there. It's just like they kick down the door and kill some monsters and find some prisoners. Your story will be more satisfying and the game will have more tension if your players, your audience, know about these prisoners at the start of the session. I'll open the session with the characters summoned to the Merchant's Guild, where the powerful merchants, the Munchburger brothers, tell them that a recent caravan was ambushed and the survivors dragged into the caves. They want to hire the characters to rescue the survivors. This is a crisis, and having a crisis sets the tension ball rolling. Tip 2. The Ticking Clock Have you ever noticed that a movie that has a ticking bomb always is more tense than a movie without one? If time is unlimited, there's no tension. That's why I prefer a game with a limited time frame. Time limits place restrictions on the character's resources. They don't have time to memorize spells, replenish supplies, or recover hit points. So here's the clock. One of the ambush survivors escape, but not before finding out the attackers aren't just bandits. They're cannibals. They're not looking for a ransom. They're looking for food. With each passing day, more survivors will be eaten. The escapee can direct the characters to the right cave, and the merchants offer a monetary reward for each survivor rescued. The DM should reward experience points based on how many people they can rescue and return home safely. And this creates a sense of urgency and will drive the narrative. Tip 3. Use the environment. So the cannibals live in Cave H, originally the bugbear lair, and I'm going to use these bugbear stats for the cannibals. I hate using typical monsters, and making your monster humans will jack up the grimdark level. These cannibals imagine that they're monsters. They wear furs and make masks from animal skulls. There's an odd yellow fungus that grows on the wall of the caves. When licked, the fungus causes intense hallucination aggression, enhanced strength, and craving for human flesh. The fungus is literally from another world. A millennia ago, the caves were created when an asteroid made impact on this spot. The core of the asteroid was composed of what is now known as Moonstone, a critical component in all potions. The surface of the asteroid was coated with a fungus, and this fungus still grows in cave age today, warping the minds of cave dwellers, turning them into cannibals, or as I call them, the Fun Guys from Yuggoth. Fun Guys have the stats of bugbears, so long as they lick the fungus once a day. If they don't, they become normal humans with severe withdrawal symptoms. I'm not going to detail every room for you. Instead, I'm going to focus on the prison cells, which is the main encounter. In the center ring of our UDT 2.0 is the following. We have two guards. They have armor class 15. They can survive three hits, whatever system you're using. They can be hit for an average of three times. They do D8 plus 2 in damage. They have an evil guard pig, armor class 15, 4 hits, damage 2d6, one prisoner, an adult male stretched out on a rack, he's currently being tenderized, another prisoner, an adult female locked in a cage, four more prisoners, children and servants in the cells, a box of supplies, including a keg of black powder used for blasting tunnels, left over from when this part of the cave was a mine and a torch stands precariously nearby. Here the terrain is of incredible importance. Because it's close quarters, anyone using a hand or a missile weapon runs the risk of hitting the prisoners on the rack and in the cage. On a natural one, the prisoners get hit and suffer regular damage. 
They have six hit points. The characters can mitigate this by fighting hand to hand without weapons. But the cultists won't care and they'll swing away with their axes. And you should describe it. Describe sparks flying as the cultist swings his axe, barely misses the characters, and narrowly misses the hands of the woman in the cage. Or the blow nicks the ear of the prisoner on the rack. Or the cage gets knocked over and rolls across the floor as people kick it back and forth. In this case, the environment itself provides a major obstacle for the player characters. Tip 4. Use timers. If you're familiar with Runehammer or Index Card RPG, you know all about timers. At the start of the encounter, the DM tosses a four-sided die, and in that number of rounds, a complication arises. The only way to stop the timer is to defeat that first obstacle. This is a fantastic way to add tension to any encounter. First cultist to die is going to topple back into the torch, knocking it over onto a pile of rags, setting them on fire. The rags sit atop a keg of black powder. Unless the characters douse the fire in D4 rounds, the keg explodes, causing the ceiling to collapse, automatically killing everyone in the circle and in the cells, regardless of their hit points. But wait, there's more. D4 rounds after the fight with the cannibals starts, a party of rival adventurers kick in the door and announce they have come to free the prisoners and will fight the characters for the privilege. This rival band calls themselves the Executioners. They're led by an egotistical, narcissistic blowhard, Max Mannheim. The Executioners are the doppelgangers of the player characters, not the monster, the literary device. They're mirror images of the party. If the party has a cleric, the Executioners have a cleric of a rival fate. If they have a wizard, the executioners have an evil wizard. If the party has a bard, the executioners have an evil bard, who sings the songs of Maroon 5 or Insane Clown Posse. Take your pick. In the last session, while the party was busy slaying the Minotaur, check out the link at the end, the executioners employed silence and invisibility spells to steal the Minotaur's loot. Now they followed the characters again and don't feel like sharing the rewards, so they'll fight over these prisoners. Any attempt to negotiate with the executioners falls on deaf ears. If the characters warn Max about the black powder, he says, Nice try, buddy, but you're gonna have to be more clever than that to fool Max Mannheim. Max is illiterate and can't read the words danger explosives on the side of the keg. He may even believe the characters have joined the cannibal cult. He's that stupid. Even as the fire spreads, the executioners will keep fighting, with Max announcing, Stay calm, folks. We'll rescue you from these maniacs. Max and his band will have virtually the same stats as the PCs. If the PCs have been wounded, the executioners have suffered commensurate wounds from fighting the cannibal cultists, so it's an even fight. But all at the same time, the characters have to juggle fanatical fungi licking cannibal cultists, a man-eating pig, a rival adventuring party, six helpless prisoners in a flaming room that's going to explode. That, my friends, is tension. But we're not done just yet, because I have to talk to you about the one thing that could kill your tension, no matter how carefully you plan it, and that is stopping the game for any reason, but especially to look up stats or rules. Here are my notes for the Cannibal Cult, laid out on a single page. I include critical stats like encounter difficulty ratings, hit points, and damage. I encourage you to do the same, whether it's your original design or someone else's. As a matter of fact, if it's someone else's, it's even more important. Here's Into the Borderlands, which includes several editions of the Caves of Chaos. When you buy a hardcover book like this, you want to know you're getting your money's worth. And as a reader and a collector, we Dungeon Masters, we enjoy reading things. And we want to see everything. We want everything to be included. As a reader, I love to read that stuff. But as a Dungeon Master, it's not necessary. Once the game hits the table, only minimal notes are necessary. When running someone else's stuff, make sure you take the time to create a one-page cheat sheet. Stopping the game to look up rules or monster stats is like pausing the last 10 minutes of Die Hard or the last 10 minutes of Psycho. When young people ask me what's the most frightening or tense movie you ever made, I always default to Psycho. People under 20, they're like, oh, I saw that. That's not scary. No, it's not scary if you keep checking your cell phone and pausing the video every 10 minutes. Hitchcock had a single objective with that film, which is to build the tension to unbearable levels. And if you text message your friends, it doesn't work anymore. Same thing with your role-playing game. The most carefully built-up tension will be completely destroyed by any interruptions. Once the players are engaged with the final battle, just play it out. If you forget a monster's special ability, or a player doesn't know the range or casting time of the spell, just make a decision and look up the rule after the game. Don't lose the momentum. It's almost impossible to get it back. 
By letting the audience know the stakes up front, putting in a ticking clock, using the environment, and incorporating timers, you will make a climax that is unforgettable. And let me know how it worked out for you in the comments below. If you found this video helpful, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. For more helpful videos, check out these over here. Comments, Facebook, and Patreon links can be found below if you want to get more involved in the channel. Once again, for Dungeon Craft, this is Professor Dungeon Master. I'll see you again next Thursday, and until then, may all your roles be natural 20s.